Five pillars of Islam. A declaration of faith. There is only one God. Prayer. Fasting. Zakah. Hajj. God has created all human beings equal. As we accept differences amongst brothers within our own families, why can't we accept differences among brothers in humanity in our own points of view about life? Do you know what Islam is? It's a way of life for all. It is taught in the Quran for big and small. Islam is a way of life, a complete way. Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah. We praise Him with all His beautiful names. I greet you all with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace and blessings of the Almighty God, Allah, be upon all of you all. We have a topic, building bridges between Hindus, Christians and Muslims. So this is going to be a more of an interactive session on Q&A. And this question and answers are allowed only for the brothers and sisters of other faiths. This is a purely an exclusive session for them. We have Dr. Bilal Phillips. So we'll straight away go on to this session. So I request Dr. Bilal Phillips to just introduce Islam briefly and start the question and answers. I would first, uh, after praising God and asking that his peace and blessings be on all of his prophets, like to welcome all of our non-Muslim guests here and uh, I appreciate your willingness to come and share your ideas with us and uh, that's what we're here for to help you to understand why we do or why we say the things that we say as Muslims and uh, to improve relations with peoples of other faiths because Ultimately, we are all trying to do what is good. We are all in favor of what is beneficial for the welfare of our communities, our societies. So we really should not be at odds with each other. We shouldn't have misunderstandings, especially in these days where communication lines of communication are readily available so that's what we are here uh, to share with you that Islam if we look at its most basic foundations what are known as the five pillars of Islam that in one way or another I'm sure you would all agree that they represent good principles for life whether it is the first of the pillars, which is a declaration of faith, that one be open with one's faith, not to hide it, to pretend, but to be real. This is what I believe, this is who I am. That is the first step for the Muslim. For a person to be a Muslim, he or she should openly declare their faith. Faith that there is only one God, which virtually all societies in the world agree that there really is only one God. But how that God is perceived is where we find differences of understandings, etc. But the idea that there is ultimately one supreme being who governs all this is shared by all societies around the world and for the believing people we are the majority those who claim that there is no supreme being they are in fact a small strange abnormal minority this is reality I know those of you who are visiting who may be atheists might say, why would you want to say that? Well, 
This is what history shows us. Wherever we go in the world, whatever age, whatever society, whatever civilization, backwards, developed, underdeveloped, people believe in God. A minority, you find in, around the world, who say there is no God. So as believers, this is a common ground that we should share and uh, help those who have lost their way to the state where they don't recognize that there is a God, help them to find their way back. And of course, for a Muslim, there is added to the basic declaration of faith that there is only one God, that the one who informed us of that, the messenger of God known as Muhammad ibn Abdullah, who appeared, uh, was born in the uh, 6th century after the time of Christ, he conveyed that message and he not only conveyed it in word, but he also conveyed it in deed. So a Muslim, when he or she declares their faith, they not only recognize the unity of God, that there is one God, ultimate God, but also that the messenger who brought this message is to be followed, meaning he represents the guide in life. He is the example of how we should live our lives. That's the first pillar of Islam. And I'm sure all religions have comparable guides. People depend on, uh, commit themselves to believing that they are the example for them. So. I'm sure any person who believes in God would say, yes, that is a reasonable principle. We should have guides. We should have somebody to show us how to live a good, righteous, pious, beneficial life. The second pillar of Islam, the prayer. Praying five times a day. Well, some people might say, well, that's a lot, you know. How about once a week or a couple of times a week? That may be a little more. Well, of course, it's a choice. If a person commits himself or herself to pray five times a day, in other words, trying to communicate with God five times a day, trying to remember God five times a day, we say the more the merrier. Really, nothing bad about that. Even if you as an individual may personally feel it's a bit too much for you, but still, the idea if somebody wanted to do that's a good thing. Because the more we remember God, the better people we will be. So, again, the second pillar of Islam, five times daily prayer. No believer in God would say, hey, that's not good. No. The third pillar, fasting. Fasting in the month of Ramadan, one month every year, Muslims are required to fast for 30 days, daylight hours. And fasting is something instituted in virtually every religion. Even if people today don't do it, we go back into the scriptures, you will find the people of the past did. So if we're not doing it and they did it, it means somehow we slipped off the path a bit. We need to get back on the path. Because fasting was prescribed by God because it is good for human beings. Whether physically or spiritually. And of course, the spiritual concerns are the greatest. Fasting which teaches self-restraint, control of one's basic desires, so that throughout the rest of the year when we're not fasting, the lessons learned in fasting should be applied. And all, of course, all of what we're talking about here are ideal principles that people should strive for. Now, I know you might say, but I know some Muslims who fast every year and they don't seem to be very restrained. 
They don't manage to restrain themselves at all. Well, probably because they're not fasting as they were supposed to fast. And because there are principles and rules for fasting. There is the letter of the law. You don't eat or drink or have sexual relations between dawn and sunset. That's the letter. But there's also spirit where the Prophet said that the person who doesn't give up uh, backbiting, telling lies, cursing, God has no reward for their fast. So a person may go through the physical requirements, but the spiritual requirements they're not taken care of. So naturally the fast doesn't have the required impact on the individual. The fourth pillar of Islam is zakah or charity which is an obligation on every member of the community who has surplus wealth. Everyone who has surplus wealth above a minimum is required to give 2.5 percent of it to the poor not to the church the temple or the mosque or to the imam or the priest but to the poor recirculating some of our surplus with the needy members of the society and the community and again anyone who believes in god even if you didn't believe in god you would say that's a good thing that's beneficial it is helpful and the last of the pillars, the one which might be a little different, that of the pilgrimage, Hajj, the fifth pillar of Islam, where Muslims uh, once every year gather some three million strong. It is a requirement once in a lifetime for those who are able. Those who are not are required to desire it. And what it represents is a celebration of the diversity of humankind and the greatness of God. Because as a Muslim here, Muslims of India are taught that God has created all human beings equal doesn't matter what so-called race they belong to, caste or position in society, etc. They are really all equal and one. But the reality of it isn't experienced until a person goes to Hajj. When a person goes to Hajj, goes to Mecca, he meets there or she meets there people from all parts of the world. And the universality of that message of the oneness of humankind comes alive on a scale which is unimaginable except for those who actually get there and see it. It's very difficult even to describe. But it's a celebration of that variety and of the fact that there is one God that brought them there, who created them and brought them there. And it is also many of the rites performed there, rites of worship, are focused on Prophet Abraham and his willingness to sacrifice his own son at the command of God. Muslims uh, accept Prophet Abraham as one of the prophets of God and we as Muslims are required to believe that God sent prophets everywhere, everywhere in the world, over 124,000 prophets. Prophets were sent everywhere. Well, of those that have remained, those that we know of, uh, Prophet Abraham is one who is spoken about quite often in the Quran, and his uh, sacrifice, his willingness to sacrifice his son is commemorated in the rites of Hajj itself. So the idea of people gathering to celebrate the unity of humankind and the oneness of God 
and the need for human beings to be prepared to sacrifice themselves for the sake of God, meaning for the sake of what is good and what is right. We should be prepared to sacrifice anything which God has given us because whatever we have belongs to God. Then again, even though the practice of pilgrimage may not be found in some religions, the concept itself is again a universal concept. So the basic pillars of Islam are pillars which are universally uh, recognized, universally accepted. And uh, that is what we have come to share here with you this afternoon. We'd like to share it with you. And any misunderstandings or anything which is not clear uh, of these pillars or our practices, we are here to clarify them for you. And with that, I think now we will turn over the floor to you to share uh, any issues or any uh, points that you'd like clarified. And please do not feel shy. Uh, know that whatever you say, we will take it in the spirit of uh, understanding and an attempt to uh, get a clear understanding, a better understanding, and not one that you are trying to attack us or one that you are trying to hurt our feelings. So don't be sh shy to ask any question. Don't feel that any question is too embarrassing or whatever. This is uh, our welcome to you to share with us anything you have. Thank you very much for being here, and we hope that you will share. Please. Uh, my name is Professor Selvarajan from Madras University. I received an invitation from you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, he has given a beautiful account of the five pillars of the Islam. And be, because you were, uh, Islam is in a different language, many people are not aware of it. Now I had a very good perception of what uh, Islam and five pillars. Sir, our President Abdul Kalam, has been telling that we must have a vision of universal brotherhood and a global family. I think you must, be, uh, you must have heard of our President Abdul Kalam. But when we go to airport or when we get into flight, we are always suspecting everyone and searching all suitcases, everything. Life is full of tension. When do you think this global family would come up? Thank you. Well, I think that the global family will only come when we are able to understand each other on the most basic levels. If we are unable to understand each other, if there are tensions amongst us between ourselves and our neighbors, you know, our communities from state to state or whatever, you know, we have not established that, that communication, those open lines of communication, on the most basic levels, then we cannot expect it to appear on the higher levels. You know, perhaps maybe we're thinking from the top down, but we need to think from the bottom up. So we need more and more gatherings of this type, you know, shared by various communities where we can share our beliefs with each other and come to mutual understandings and to work out whatever problems and misunderstandings exist amongst us. Because truly, we are one humanity. Uh, we are from the same origin. And as we accept differences amongst brothers within our own families, why can't we accept differences among brothers in humanity in our own points of view about life? Uh, Dr. Rajan, I am a scientist from the Ministry of Agriculture. And I am also a member from the International Association of Lions Clubs, wherein I have participated in the international conference in Denver, Colorado, USA last year. And I am also the World Constitution World Parliament member that was constituted in Virginia University. And now I have one question. God is one. We represent different religions for worship. We human beings representing from various uh, religions for worship. And why we embrace, uh, that is, uh, Islam? Kindly enlighten this point. As far as Muslims believe, and now we're talking about sharing belief, right? Muslims believe, yes, that there is only one God. 
There is only one human race. Even though we've been told there is a variety of races, no, there's just one. And therefore, the need of human beings to worship God, to live in accordance with God's will, that need is fulfilled through God revealing one religion. Because human beings don't have different needs in that sense. We all have the same uh, emotions, it's the same psychology, uh, our organization of societies may differ because of technology and things, but basically it's the same. We have a family structure, we have communities, we have states, wherever you go. In history, no, no matter how far back you go in time, you know, it is the same situation. Human beings have not changed. So we believe that when God created the first two human beings, Adam and Eve, he taught them he informed them of how he wanted them to live. That we call religion. How he wanted them to live because he gave them guidelines in terms of how they should relate between themselves, interpersonal relationships, how they should relate to the world around them, which God has provided for them, and how they should relate to God. That religion is not restricted to just how you relate to God, but how you also relate to each other, how do you deal with the environment around you. So religion, the religion of God was taught to Adam and Eve, the first two human beings. First two human beings who Allah or God created, they were taught the religion of God. As time passed, people multiplied, people strayed away from that original religion, made changes, corrupted, added, and God sent messengers, prophets, to bring people back to that original religion. And as people spread to different parts of the world, of course the prophets were sent to the different parts of the world always calling them back to that original religion. Islam holds, as Muslims claim, that that original religion was Islam. That Islam itself means submission to the will of the creator, sustainer of this world the one God, who in Arabic his name is Allah. That one God who is not material of the creation, but the creator himself. So submission to the will of God, meaning submission to the commandments and instructions of God, that is what Adam and Eve were told. To do and this is what uh, describes that final revelation of that same religion according to the teachings of Islam so we believe really yes there should be one religion but human beings are free to make their own choices Human beings are free to choose for themselves what they feel is best for themselves. And in the end, they will be accountable to God for their choices. That is the sum of our belief with regards to that. My name is Dr. S. Ramu. I am not a Muslim, but I was born and brought up in a Muslim atmosphere, educated completely in a Muslim school. I have, I am tremendously influenced by the teachings of uh, Prophet Muhammad and what is contained in the Quran. And I happen to go through English as well as Tamil version of Quran. I, from a, for a long time, 
I have been raising a simple doubt which I want to present here. Take for example Christianity is being preached and followed almost all over the world because I think it is being propagated in the language of the folk, in the language of the people where it is being propagated. For example in, in, in Tamil Nadu, we, in most of the Christian uh, propagations are made in Tamil. People are allowed to worship Jesus Christ or to uh, do any kind of worship in the vernacular language, in the local language. Whereas Islam is insisting on the Arabic language only. I think that is the major impediment for people to follow Islam and to understand what is contained in uh, Quran. Therefore, is there any solution for this that uh, prayer or worship can be allowed in the local languages? Quran can be translated in almost all languages and uh, uh, made cheaper uh, available to the people so that even the common man can understand Islam and follow. And this uh, question I, before, I place before you and I uh, seek some answer. Is there any positive solution for this? Uh, because language can easily uh, attract people. A Tamil language through which you can spread the Islam, the good teachings of uh, Islam. Nowadays, Islam is being the most misinterpreted religion. It is being uh, 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 deliberately done by some section of the society, which is not acceptable. I don't accept such a uh, miscreant uh, uh, propaganda. Therefore, I request, is there any solution for this problem? And can, will you allow local languages to be followed in your worship? Thank you very much. Arabic also allows Muslims to worship together wherever they are. If I went to Peking and people called the Adhan, the call to prayer in Chinese, then I wouldn't know because the mosques in China don't look like the mosques in India. There's not a special shape that a mosque has to take. It's just a place of worship. It could be a room, a single room. So the Adhan or the call to prayer is done in Arabic so that if I happen to be in Peking, I would know that there is a mosque here and I would enter that mosque. And if the Imam, the one who leads the prayer, led the prayer in Chinese, I wouldn't know what is going on either. But since prayer is done in Arabic, I can join in his prayer. So the Arabic becomes a unifying force for Muslims throughout the world. Wherever they go, regardless of their languages, they're able to pray together. Furthermore, as my brother mentioned, it is the language of the original revelation. And Muslims are all enjoined and encouraged to learn some Arabic, to stay in contact with the words of God, of Allah, as they were revealed. As he said, translation gives you an idea of the meaning, but the words of God themselves have their own beauty, have their own impact. So the translation of the meanings of the Quran has been done in most of the major religions of the world. We have uh, the Quran's meanings translated into Tamil. It's an example of the Tamil translation of the uh, meanings of the Quran as well as many other languages. So we appreciate your suggestion and I hope you've understood the reasoning. Next question please. I'm Nirmal Raj. Uh, I was told by my Muslim friends that God created us to worship Him. Uh, and those people who are worshipping Him, they'll go to heaven and those who are not worshipping Him, they'll be passed into the hell. And my doubt is that, is that the, our whole purpose of life is only to worship God? Or do our life have some other purpose? And if so, what is the actual purpose of our life? When the Quran states that God created, Allah created human beings, and the spirit world we know as the jinn, solely for worshipping him. That means that for Muslims, according to Muslim belief, that is the essential purpose of life, to worship God. But we have to ask ourselves, 
what do we mean by worship? See, if we think of worship as uh, merely calling on God and asking Him when we have a need, then that is not what is meant by the statement that we were created to worship God. What is meant is that we live all of our lives in accordance with His will. In doing so, we are worshiping. So worship includes all aspects of life, from the time you get up in the morning, how you function, how you clean yourself, how you deal with your family, how you deal it at work, in all aspects of your life, till you go to bed at night, you, when you go back to sleep, all of that becomes worship if you do it in accordance with what God has prescribed for you. So that way of life which God has prescribed, which transforms all of your acts into worship, that way of life brings out from the human being the best, makes him or her the best that he or she can be. So that's the idea, that is the goal behind it. So this life being, this world being a transition world, we believe that there is a greater life to come the everlasting life. This life is a limited life. We're born at a certain point, we die at a certain point. So this is a transitional world. The state of our world to come depends on this life. Depends on us living this life in the way which God wanted us to live the life. If we do so, we earn the better life in the life to come. If we don't, then we lose that. So worship enables us to achieve the goal of this life or the purpose of the life that we're living. Is that clear? You have a follow-up on it? Go ahead. I'm satisfied with your answer. Um, but one, one doubt is, what does he expect out of us? Why should he create such a test to us? The issue of what does he expect of us, that is the religion, that is the way of life which he has prescribed for us. That's what he expects of us, to live to our utmost potential in good and in goodness and in righteousness. That is what is expected of us. Why did he create us and expect that of us? He is the creator. Being the creator, he created. You don't ask the painter why you painted. In the same way, you don't ask the creator why he created. There's a point of questioning where we accept, well, this is one of the attributes of the one God who rules this world. He is the creator and he created us. He chose this life for us because it was what was best for us. Those who follow his instructions and do what is required, then this life becomes in fact best for us. Those who follow a life of their own choice, enjoy here, disregard the instructions of God, then this life will be a source of torment for us in the next. My name is Ambalavana. Throughout my life, my observation of all the religions, this is my perception. I am not casting any aspirations. The meaning of forgetfulness and forgiveness and tolerance. Is it wanting in this religion? Because the way in which you have put the invitation, the aftermath of the uh, September 11th incident, the Islam's tolerance and Islam's forgiveness principle, you need much more explanation or much more 
level of tolerance. Because I find that Islam, it's only my perception, it's not my view, doesn't have that much of tolerance and forgiveness as other religions. I would suggest that you read the life of the Prophet to see where tolerance and forgiveness is expressed, you know, as the originator of the final message of Islam, to see how it is expressed there. And if you read also the Quran, you will find tolerance and forgiveness and uh, mercy expressed throughout it. In fact, each chapter of the Quran is begun with the phrase Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the most merciful. So that is the teaching of Islam. If you find some Muslims intolerant, and I won't deny that they may not have been, and they're not around today too, uh, that is their individual practices or ignorance or whatever, emotionality or whatever. But that is not the teaching of Islam. If we consider, for example, the greatest example, one of the big examples from the uh, life of the Prophet, that when he was driven out of Mecca with his followers and followers were murdered, their wealth taken, eventually after some 10 years, he came back and reconquered Mecca without a fight. Mecca surrendered. And the people of Mecca were wondering what is going to happen to us because how we treated you previously, we killed you and did all these different things to you. Then they were expecting what they normally do when they capture an area is they kill everybody. They slaughter them, they take their women and wealth and this is what they were doing. So they asked him, what are you going to do to us? You know, you are one of us. Are you going to be merciful to us? He said, go all of you, you are free. Go all of you, you are free. That was his magnanimity. That was his generosity. That was his kindness. That was his tolerance. You know? And that is the example throughout actually Muslim history. If we look at the great points, we look at the difference between when Salahuddin, if you're looking at uh, conquering, for example, when Salahuddin conquered. Uh, uh, Palestine. Palestine had been conquered by the Crusaders hundred years before. And when they came in, according to Crusader uh, history, they massacred all of the inhabitants. Their horses marched in the streets with blood up to the ankles of the horses. They massacred not only the Muslims, but the Jews who were there as well as the Christians who didn't follow their own brand of Christianity. And when Salahuddin conquered Jerusalem he spared everyone he spared everyone no life was taken and that was in keeping with the example of the Prophet before him Omar the second Caliph took Jerusalem and he did the same so there was an example set by the Prophet. Historically, people follow that example for the most part, but there are examples in history where people didn't. So when we are to look at these different examples, we judge them according to the original example. We say, well, this is what Islam actually taught, but these people did something other than its teachings. So Islam really is a religion full of tolerance, full of forgiveness. But sometimes we find that Muslims aren't. My name is Ram Nathan, I'm a former employee of the United Nations. I'm, I would like to know the meaning of the term hadith. A hadith meaning 
uh, conversation, literally in English, in, uh, English translation, or something new, um, from the context, the technical term in, in, uh, in Arabic, it refers to the sayings, actions, approvals of the Prophet. It's, so it's com the, the, this is represents, the Quran represents direct revelation. Yes, it came on the tongue of the Prophet, but it's direct words of God recorded and memorized. Then the implementation of the Quran. The Quran says pray, but doesn't tell you how many times to pray, when to pray, uh, how to pray. It just says pray. The hadith now clarifies the details. So the Prophet's life, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, is contained within the hadith as the example. Is there any uh, sisters of other faiths there? As per uh, God's word, Islam believes in God's birth, Jesus Christ's birth and his second coming. And why he didn't doesn't believe in God's death? Please kindly explain me. As you said, Islam believes in God's birth. No, we don't. We believe in Jesus' birth. God, one of the basic attributes of God is that he is eternal. Once we say that God is eternal, to speak about his birth or his death is contradictory. He is without beginning, without end. Everything else of his creation has a beginning and has an end. So we don't speak of God's birth, nor do we speak of God's death. We speak of Jesus' birth and we do not believe that Jesus was God. Jesus, we believe, was a prophet of God. We do believe he was born of a virgin, that Mary was not married. In Islamic tradition in the Quran, you will not find any mention of marriage there at all. So we do believe in the virgin birth. But the virgin birth was still by the will of God, an act of creation of God, not proof that Jesus was God because we believe Eve was born without a mother. So if Jesus was God because he was born without a father, then what do we say of Eve? Furthermore, Adam was born or came into being without father and mother. So what do we say of Adam? So we look at Jesus' birth, though miraculous, as being a part of the four modes of creation. God may create us without a father and mother, or with father and mother, or without a father, or without a mother. These are the four possibilities. Yes. One of the most confusing words which we have in Islam is uh, jihad. I would like to know the real meaning and the purpose of jihad. Jihad, Arabic word, uh, means to struggle, to strive, to do something good, to overcome something evil. The Prophet said, May God's peace and blessings be upon him. The best jihad is a perfect hajj, perfect pilgrimage. Because in going to make pilgrimage, you have to control yourself. People will step on your toes. People will, maybe you'll lose some of your, your uh, provisions. You know, you will find difficulty. And people crush together three million people in one location. You can imagine there will be uh, people's tempers, all these things will be there and, and you will be driven to want to argue or to shout or to get upset and, but you're told to be calm, to be patient. The perfect Hajj, which one is able to get through that, those eight days without flying off the handle, you know, uh, arguing with people next to you, shouting at somebody else, but patiently bearing whatever difficulties you find. So, the Prophet said this was the best jihad. Hajj was the best jihad. 
So this is telling us that the term jihad, though today it is associated with picking up a gun and trying to kill somebody, this is not the original meaning of the term. Now jihad has a variety of different levels. It may require that one picks up a gun, you know, to defend one's life or to defend one's community, uh, where one comes under attack. Yes, this is there too. But it starts at the most basic level in the heart. On another occasion, the Prophet had said that the greater jihad is the jihad of the heart, where one struggles against the evil tendencies within the heart, because God has created us with an awareness of both good and evil. Each human being is born with that. And religion is supposed to help that good side, support the good side, help the person to make the right choices. But still, it is the individual who has to make those choices. So when that individual struggles against his or her evil tendencies, they are involved in jihad at the most basic level. And if one cannot engage in that level of jihad, then no of the other levels, none of the other levels are true jihad. Because we do this for the sake of God believing that this is what is pleasing to God. This is what God wants from us, that we be good people, we promote goodness, we live goodness. So on the basic level, which is required of us, if we cannot do that, then even on the highest levels where we're fighting, uh, offering our lives up, supposedly to defend the faith, or the believers or the country of the believers or whatever whatever level it is it will be missing that most vital component and the prophet had said that such a person who fights there without that vital component in fact will not earn the reward will not be a true martyr will in fact end up uh, a loser in the next life so jihad is the struggle against evil on all levels. Ah, 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 ah,